Hi, WorkWell listeners. I'm really excited to share that my book, Work Better Together, is officially out. Conversations with WorkWell guests and feedback from listeners like you inspired this book. It's all about how to create a more human-centered workplace. And as we return to the office for many of us, this book can help you move forward into post-pandemic life with strategies and tools to strengthen your relationships and focus on your well-being. It's available now from your favorite book retailer. Work and fun. These are two words you don't often hear together. Why? Because of the pervasive idea that fun at work is a distraction. You can't be productive at work and have fun at the same time. But this is just a myth. In fact, having fun at work can increase engagement, connection, and creativity, making teams more innovative and even more productive. This is the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Gary Ware. He's a strategic play consultant, improv comedian, sought-after corporate facilitator, keynote speaker, and author of the book Playful Rebellion. Gary has over a decade of ex- Gary has over a decade of experience as a performer in improv theater and in the corporate world leading teams. He's also the founder of Breakthrough Play and passionate about helping professionals level up their confidence, creativity, and happiness using play. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I'm really excited. I'm excited about this topic. Um, We're going to have a lot of fun, right? Oh, hopefully, yeah. (laughs) To put the pressure on. So Gary, tell us about yourself. You know, tell me who you are, where you came from, and then tell us how you became passionate about play and fun. Awesome. Yeah. So my name is Gary Ware. Uh, I run a small firm called Breakthrough Play, where it's our mission to use playful methods to help individuals and teams um, level up all areas of their life so they can be more creative. Um, collaborate on a better level, and at the end of the day, just be their authentic self. Mm -hmm. Um, This isn't something that I set out to do. Uh, Matter of fact, my training um, in education is in marketing and communications, and I I thought I was going to be like the next Don Draper. (laughs) Tell me, wait, 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 I got to stop you there. Tell me, tell me about the next Don Draper. I got to know more about this. (laughs) Yeah, and and so. This was actually pre Mad Men, uh, but I, you know, very creative individual. I thought I was going to, you know, graduate uh, from art school. I went to the Art Institute in uh, Los Angeles, mm-hmm. um, you know, get hired at a top uh, agency and just ride the wave, and then you know, eventually, you know, uh, be a big executive in in that world. Got now, it. don't get me wrong, I did that, and it happened really fast. Mm. And I found myself sitting at my desk. Um, At the time, I worked for this large uh, independent digital marketing agency. Um, I was a director. I had, uh, I think, under me, I had about at least 20 people that reported up to me. And I felt like a fraud. I was like, oh, my gosh. Uh, What? Like, people are going to find out that I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm a bad manager. And... It's interesting because I got all the things that I set out to do, but I felt miserable. I was burning myself out. And I had a conversation with a mentor of mine. And he, you know, I was talking to him about like, you know, hey, I, I want to get better at this management thing. I was really good at my job. And then all of a sudden they thought I can deal with people. And then now I have this huge staff <laughs> and I don't know what to do. And he suggested that I take an improv class. And that was the last thing I was thinking <laughs> that I would that would help me. I thought he was going to suggest some sort of leadership class. And he said, trust me, I I think this is going to blow your mind. And so I did. I I took this improv class. I was really scared to go. And, but I'm glad I did because in that class, it was just amazing. It, It like for two hours, I was completely present. We did these weird activities. Um, you know, there were about 15 other people and I left like feeling ecstatic i i matter of fact when i got home my wife thought i was drunk i was not drunk <laughs> i just was playing and mm-hmm. that was the catalyst that was the thing 
that got me thinking, hey, there there has to be something different than this way that as adults, you know, that we're showing up and, you know, we wear these masks where we, you know, we're telling everyone, oh, yeah, we're fine. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I can do all this work and I can work, you know, 12 plus hours a day and, and I'll sleep when I'm dead. However, when, you know, I was in that play-like state, um, yeah, it's like I saw the world differently. So that was the catalyst of me diving down this rabbit hole. Um, and, you know, I've been, you know, I got so hooked on improv that I've been doing it for the last 12 years. Uh, I perform it. Uh, I teach it. And I've taken the taken the principles of improv and applied it to my work. And I thought that was just going to be it. Like I was going to, like my mentor said, use all these things that I've learned through improv and I would still be, you know, in the, you know, sort of advertising realm. And as far as my trajectory, I ended up co-founding a digital marketing agency. Um, and I, I thought I, yep, I made it. Here I am. I, I set out everything that I that I set out to do. And then um, I guess the universe had different plans for me because four years after going into this endeavor, um, my business partner ended up pushing me and our other partner out of the business. Mm. And I found myself um, at this crossroads um, where at the time my wife um, – my wife wasn't working. We had a one-year-old and I was the only one working. And two hours after this conversation with my business partner, where he sort of pushed me out the business and said, Hey, we need to go our separate ways. Uh, our landlord called and said, Hey, um, I'm going to have to sell your house. Wow. And so, yeah, when it, it was the poor, so. exactly. And so then I really got thinking like, all right, so I'll just go get another gig. You know, what do I do? And my wife, Thank God for her. She she's the uh, she was the rock in this situation. She realized that I was really enjoying doing these leadership activities uh, because at this point, um, yes, I was doing everything that I learned um, through my work with what is called applied improvisation for my own team. But I was being asked to do this for other teams, and I was you know it was a hobby for me. It was something that I just loved to do. I did for fun. She said why don't you explore this a little bit deeper? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there could be something something there. And so that was the main thing that put me on this path that led us to have this conversation that we're having today. So let's talk about, you're a strategic play consultant, which I love. Did you coin that term? I might have. Uh, and it was one of those things where a number of people, you know, are, are looking for solutions. And then I like to tell them, that yes, I use play, but I use it in strategic ways. Mm -hmm. And it was something that made it uh, more accessible and then made it so that people were like, okay, we're not going to just play ring around the rosy for two hours and, and you expect us to have a solution. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> play is just my tool of helping you get results. And so that's where it came from. Okay. And so tell me, like, tell me a little bit more about like what that is. Like, what does that look like in practice? Yeah. So before I, I tell you like some examples, if we think about when we were younger, everything that we were learning was through play. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a five-year-old now and, and he is learning right now he's in kindergarten. So, you know, he's learning the days of the week and he's learning the alphabets and it's through song and it's through play. Um, and then at a certain point, you know, we, we sort of drop that and we, we get very serious. But the interesting thing about, play and playfulness it for your brain it's like simulation and so when you can get into that state of play and playfulness you can actually um get your your outcomes and results four times faster um there was this researcher her name is karen previs and she was doing research on uh neural pathways and she was working with kids and she found out to create a new neural pathway. So what that means is, um, like, say you're learning something, um, and it's essentially writing the code in your brain so that you can do it without really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It takes about 420 repetitions for you to create a new neural pathway, you know, over and over and over again. However, um, Ms. Previs found out that if you can add play, you can get there within 20 repetitions. Wow. Exactly. And that doesn't just stop when we, you know, become adults. 
Uh, we are uh, neotenous creatures, which essentially means that we retain our juvenile features into adulthood, uh, which means that we are wired for play. Um, you know, that part of us that we sort of left, um, you know, to become an adult is still there. You know, we we may be a little bit atrophied because we haven't done it in a while. But when you can get into a play like state, because your brain sees it as simulation, you're going to be more likely to, you know, make bolder choices. And but the cool thing is you're still creating those neural pathways. And so what I do is I, you know, figure out, all right, what are we working for? What's what's the variable? And, you know, lately it's been things like burnout or it's been things like um, community or things like communication, things that we've sort of been lacking and we haven't um, had enough practice with because of the global pandemic as of, you know, the recording of this. Mm -hmm. And so I create um, and I curate activities that allow people to, quote unquote, play with it in a low stakes environment and then we can have meaningful conversations where your brain is connecting the dots between this seemingly trivial activity that we did and something very important as, you know, communicating with your colleagues, um, you know, in stressful situations. So do you, um, I mean, how much of this is, I guess, is it, is it like improv related activities or can you like kind of yeah. tell me what that looks like or give yes. me an example of one. Yeah. So one of the, so it started as um, improv because that was, you know, yeah. the thing that was the catalyst for me. And I learned a term called applied improvisation. So that is using improv like techniques mm. to um, in non improv context. So, you know, things that improvisers use to be able to tell stories without a script on a stage, you take those activities and then you apply it, you know, to an accounting firm working on, you know, again, how to think on their feet and whatnot, those same activities, again, can correlate. That was the start. But then once I started learning about play and how all activities in a playful way can lead to amazing breakthroughs, then I started getting creative. And I said, all right, if that's the case, you know, what if we did, um, like, for example, I was working with um, a team, uh, he was working with um, uh, the the people within his team, he was the manager. And this was uh, this was uh, pre-COVID. However, you know, I'm pretty sure there can be a virtual way of doing this. But I had them play um, a game of Monopoly. And the manager just watched. And I have this belief, how you play anything is how you do anything. And again, afterwards, we had this important conversation about decision making. And how they played Monopoly was very similar to how they made decisions in the work environment. So this, again, because when you're in a play like state, you are, you know, you're letting your guard down, you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And um, there's so many lessons that you can learn um, from just playing a game and how you, um, you know, relate in the real world. So work and fun aren't, <laughs> <laughs> aren't words that you hear together in the same sentence uh, very often. As a matter of fact, I have heard things like work is not supposed to be fun, or if people are having fun at work, then they aren't working hard enough, or they're not being productive, or they're, you know, pick your favorite into that sentence. Um, why do you think that is? And how can we change that perception? Like what's dangerous about that perception? Well, one is outdated, <laughs> uh, and if we just wind the clock back, um, a lot of this, you know, sort of came from the Protestant work ethic, where the belief was you should be working six days a week, twelve hours a day, and if you are having fun, you know, you're probably doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, but then, um, thanks to Henry Ford, Henry Ford got us to the eight hours a day, forty hour work week. And people thought he was crazy. Right. They 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 were like, "What are you talking about?" Um, you know, and if, you're... and if only we could really get back to the forty hour work week now, we'd we'd all be oh, think it was amazing. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh, exactly. And so again, this was something that was just put into place, and no one questioned it because the type of work that we were doing back then was very tactical work. Mm. It was very tactical. You follow these to a T. You know, don't do anything other than that, um, and we're good to go. And the motivators that we had for that were external. And we still have a lot of these motivators today. However, they're 
not as effective. So these external motivators are uh, emotional pressure, as in, um, hey, if you make a mistake, you could be fired. Do not make a mistake, you know, things like that. Economic pressure, as in, you know, in the form of bonuses Mm -hmm. or (laughs) lack of income, you know, because, again, you could be fired or inertia. You know, we've always done things this way. And so um, that, again, if you want tactical performance, those are proven ways to get people to do things the exact same way over and over again um, without any changes. However, we live in an environment where we need to be creative. Um, I can't really think of a, um, a job where there isn't some form of ambiguity, something that might pop up that would require someone to think on their feet. And so in order to do that, that's where these sort of playful methods come in. And um, again, this has been researched for decades. If you want to, you know, sort of study up on that, um, researchers, Lindsay McGregor and Neil Dosey, you know, they talk about this all the time. Um, and this is something that I've adapted into my work. Uh, but those intrinsic motivators are play, purpose, and potential. And, you know, play being the big one. And when I say play, it's not just goofing around and having fun. But you see the work as something that you can do um, regardless of, you know, the outcome. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, it's like a – it's almost like you're getting to the state of flow. Uh, Researcher Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talks about flow, and it's very similar to play in that when you're in flow, time flows by, um, you know, like an instant. You're being challenged just enough. And it's something that is, um, you know, inherently pleasurable. If you think about any sort of work doesn't feel like work. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And it's possible for that to happen. However, when people start seeing that happening, they just, again, we, you know, we're just running outdated programs and, you know, we see that as, oh, they're potentially goofing off. However, there is uh, s- substantial um, data that shows that when teams are in a playful state, um, not only do they enjoy their job more, they enjoy the people that they're working with more and they are willing to work harder and longer. And as a leader, aren't those the things that you want? Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, from a well-being perspective, I'm not sure harder and longer all the time, but sometimes is good. <laughs> yeah, well, so so to that point is when they're in a play-like state, um, they it, are regulating their energy. So there's, there's not there's not a negative hit to their it, well-being. Yeah, there's exactly. a positive. Yeah, it's positive. Yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah, we're working hard. We yep. realize, oh, we need a break. We have that break, you know, and we do the things that are necessary to, um, you know, improve our energy. Then we can go back to work. Whereas the flip side and what is pretty constant is that people think that, oh, you know what? I will quote unquote play when the work is done, but the work is never done. And then they think that they have more energy than they do. And then they work longer without breaks. And then they're not as productive because they're not as accurate. Absolutely. So let, let's talk a little bit more about kind of your specific methodology yes. um, and breakthrough with breakthrough play and Love then it. how you use that with teams. Like give me some, tell me, like, tell me a little bit more about it, but then give me some examples on how you use it with teams. Yeah. So the, I like to say the entry level to working with me is usually um, some sort of team building uh, retreat. I've been getting a lot of that lately because, you know, teams are Mm -hmm. starting to gather um, again and it's everyone's first time. (laughs) And, you know, they're they're saying, hey, it's the first time that we've gathered in 18 months or whatever the case may be. And we just want to have connection. We want to, you know, do something that's a little bit light. um, And at the same time, you know, if we can learn something, that would be great. And so what I typically do in my intake is understand, all right, well, what are some of those, I call them essential skills, you know, other people call them soft skills, but what are some of those? on that. (laughs) Yeah. um, You know, there's nothing soft about these skills. Nothing. (laughs) They're actually the hardest skills of all. (laughs) Agreed. And what are those skills that, you know, if you think about after we're done working together, would be, you know, great to have developed even further. And again, lately, you know, it has been uh, around uh, some topics are, um, you know, resiliency, um, communication, you know, collaboration, you know, things of that nature. And then uh, I, you know, 
I curate activities and, you know, it's usually anywhere between an hour to two hours. And we're doing these, you know, seemingly silly activities, uh, but they, they're deep because after we finish one of them, we have a discussion. What was challenging about that? Um, what did you have to do to be successful? Um, what are some skills that you're cultivating that is helping you when you get back to work? And, you know, more importantly, you know, if you apply these skills, like how would things be different, you know, at work? And this is where the light bulb starts coming on for people. You know, matter of fact, uh, you know, quick anecdote, I was working with um, a large um, uh, a sales team for uh, a sports organization um, here in the U.S. And that, uh, which was, it was the head of sales after the activity, she was literally almost in tears. And she was realizing that the way that she was running her team was inefficient. However, that's what she thought was the way that she needed to do it because that's how it's always been done. Mm -hmm. And she realized through this activity that we did that she is a bottleneck. And that was something that she came up with herself. And because, again, when you create a playful experience, you create high levels of psychological safety, which means that people feel comfortable expressing these things and, you know, being themselves. The team, you know, we, you know, hit pause and they took 20 minutes as a group to brainstorm ways that things can shift once they went back to work. Mm. And so again, that's like the typical of how people, you know, start, uh, you know, start working with me. However, I, I tell people, all right, that's great. But, you know, how often do you do team building, you know, events like this, probably quarterly, maybe every six months, some cases once a year, that would be the equivalent of going to the gym and going to a trainer and, and say, all right, cool. After one workout, I got my six pack abs. I'm good. I'm done. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Or, or the equivalent of buying a car and then not doing, um, you know, your your tune ups and stuff like that. So after every session that I do, I have them do a reflection and think about what are the things that they're going to commit to working on as a result of this experience. Because the way that the brain works is, say you learn something new, if you don't apply it within 14 days, mm -hmm. it will be as if you did not learn it at all. Your brain just flushes it right out of the system. So I want them to, again, reap the benefits and, you know, see an ROI on this investment. So then they create this list of things that they're going to, you know, work with or play with. And a lot of it is additional training that they need. Now, it doesn't mean that they need to hire me for all these things. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, they need to have a consultant come in and they work on some DEI um, initiatives or, you know, maybe they realize that, oh, you know, we need, um, you know, a speech coach to come in or whatever the case may be, but they, they have this action list. And usually this is, um, you know, something that, you know, teams will have for the next six months, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, if they're, if, if it makes sense with the things that I offer, then I would come in and we would do a more specific training on one of those core skills and there are activities and initiatives that are around that. And again, it's like, if we're doing, um, you know, going back to the exercise, um, you know, metaphor, it's like we're isolating the muscle to work on that muscle. In your work, do you find that with these activities, with these play activities that you do, are there like, are there people that are just naturally more playful and others that are more skeptical? And like, how do you, how do you overcome some of that? <laughs> All the above. Yes. <laughs> there. And is not always just an extrovert versus introvert thing. Right, right. Um, you know, sometimes we get the, you know, the loudest person that is the biggest skeptic. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, sometimes the, you know, more person that might be a little bit more introverted that, you know, is open to these things. And so how I deal with that is essentially how we deal with uh, play situations. I don't like this to be a force thing. Mm. Usually what happens is that a lot of times, you know, I get hired, I get brought in and people have no idea what's going on. So of course, you know, they come with skepticism, like, Oh, it's going to be one of these things, right? We're going to do a trust fall is that we're <laughs> going to do get, you know? And so I invite them because that's when, when it comes to play to truly reap the benefits of play, you have to come um, with your own sort of free will. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't be challenged and pushed outside of your comfort zone, but you have to be willing to play the game. You know, just like any sort of game that you've ever played, you know, that's just how it is. Um, so I slowly, um, you know, start to engage them. And just like with 
any game that you've played. Um, especially if we take like video games, video games are very good at this. You know, the first level, it's so easy. And then you're rewarded and you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm starting to be good at this. And then like the next level is a little bit more challenging, but you're rewarded along the way. That's how I structure my um, experiences so that people can start to feel comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. And we're building this um, psychological safety where everyone is participating and you see your boss, you know, being vulnerable and sometimes looking silly. And you realize like, oh. All right, cool. And then you see, you know, Sam over in accounting is participating. And then it, you you get what I call uh, the DOSE, which is an acronym for uh, D-O-S-E, which stands for dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Those are the neurochemicals in our body that helps us be more creative. It helps us focus. It helps us trust each other. And it helps us um, realize that we belong. Got it. So... So let's talk a little bit about your new book um, called Playful Rebellion. Yes. And we've heard a lot about play. I want to know, I want to know the rebellion piece. Why the, why the rebellion? <laughs> yes. And so it's just like what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. We've been conditioned to, you know, to act a certain way at work, to, you know, see, you know, play as a frivolous activity, to work, you know, more than we should. And if you think about like how our brains are, are wired, if we introduce something, you know, new, um, you know, to the environment, a lot of times our brain, you know, we're met with resistance. And the reason why I call it the playful rebellion is that I would, I found myself doing these um, either at a conference or, or a team building thing. And in the moment, everyone's like, wow, this is great. I love it. And then they go back to work and then they're met with that resistance because, their brains like, oh no, 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 this 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 is how we are supposed to do things. And so why I call it rebellion is we are rebelling against the status quo. We are rebelling against our old conditioning that states that play is something that just kids do, that play cannot possibly make teams stronger and and you know bond better. And also uh I'm a big Star Wars fan. So <laughs> that's funny. That's great. So tell me a little bit about like I want to, you know, dig into the idea that, you know, like, when do you, when do you know, like as a team leader or as an individual that's on a team, like, how do you approach this idea of play? Like, how do you know the difference between like, when is it a time to kind of be serious and when is it a time to introduce play? Does that make sense? Yep. Makes perfect sense. Um, it's one of those things where, if you think about uh, uh, like what is your method, mm -hmm. who is the audience and what is the purpose? So map, M-A-P. <laughs> so, you know, is your method of playfulness, um, you know, a sort of like a, a silly email that maybe has some gifts because um, your purpose is to lighten the mood and your audience is internal. All right, cool. You know, so those are some of the things that I, talk to leaders about to help them understand sort of playfulness. So that's the first thing, you know, use a map uh, as a way to understand, like, you know, does this make sense? You know, sometimes, yes, if, if you're sending something out to your stakeholders, um, you know, uh, your, your stockholders in an organization, that might not be, that might not be the right audience, you know, for that. Um, and, you know, the method, you know, needs to be different. So that is the first thing of thinking about playful moments, but also, when it comes to play, uh, as I mentioned before, play is also a sort of form of getting in um, in flow. Mm -hmm. So when you think of your work, how can you think of it as something that you're overcoming challenges? Um, and this is like where we can get into some gamification elements so that when you get into the work, you know, it's something that you're like, oh, yeah, I I'm. I really want to get into that. Um, and it could be something very trivial that maybe, you know, you wouldn't normally think of it as playfulness. Uh, but if you can, again, get into that state of flow, the time's going to go by a lot f uh, faster and you're going to be more efficient compared to if you're just having to slog through and it's just something that is just a, a chore. And so is that, so in this state of play, play or flow, I mean, is that something that, 
we always have to do with others or can we do this on our own to create, you know, kind of more joy in our work day? Yes, it could be something that is done solo um, or it could be, you know, something that is done in groups. So on a solo um, method, um, especially because a number of teams are still uh, distributed, you know, maybe yeah. they're not completely in office. And I was working with um, I was doing a coaching session with an individual and for them, you know, they're, you know, prone to like sort of overwork um, just because that's just how they've been, you know, sort of accustomed to doing things. And they realizing that they're burning themselves out. And so what we started doing, um, I gave them a recipe and I talk about this in my book of looking at key moments and how can they create um, almost like a trigger so they know, oh, now is the time to add a bit of play for myself so that I can create, um, you know, the energy that I need to keep going um, and, and keep the work novel. And so the recipe is very simple. After I blank or before I blank, I will do blank so that I can feel blank. Um, you know, a situation for them is after I had a tough meeting, I will take 10 minutes and um, for them, you know, they found that um, playful things that they liked, you know, had to do with movement. Um, I would take 10 minutes, uh, listen to music and dance because it will make me feel more alive. I, again, this is a very personal thing. Um, so, you know, what is seen like play for one person might not be play for another person. Um, you know, that's why you sort of really need to tap into your own uh, sort of self and what are the things that will spark joy for you. Uh, but that's just one way, you know, for that person, just again, to help them um, be able to break their day up. So it's just not straight work, 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 work um, for teams. Um, one thing that um, I had recommended again, so that you can see the work as play and use that intrinsic motivation to, you know, help you uh, really realize like, why am I doing this um, is on, um, either Fridays or Mondays, um, you know, look at the things that you have to overcome and think about like, all right, what challenges are we overcoming as a team? And again, you know, now you're, you're trying to prime your brain to see the work is play. And you mentioned gamification. Can you talk a little bit about what that could look like? Yeah. So a gamification is using game like elements mm -hmm. um, in a non game environment um, as a way to motivate um, individuals to, um, to, again, you know, do the work. So, um, you know, some game-like elements are, um, you know, sort of points, uh, you know, badges, um, you know, things like that. So it depends. Every person has, like, different sort of motivators. Uh, but at the end of the day, the biggest gamification is how can you, what do you need to do to see the work that you're doing as play? And, you know, how you can tap into that is you know, understanding, you know, what is your why? You know, wh why, why are you here? Why are you doing this work? And once you understand that, um, you know, then how can you really sort of tap into that in a, um, you know, more playful way as overcoming challenges? Because again, when we are playing games, regardless if it's a video game or it's a board game or it's a sports game, when we are met with adversity, that is, is good. That's a good thing. <laughs> we want that mm -hmm. because if we didn't have that, it would be boring and we wouldn't want to play. So how can you see the uh, adversity that you're met in your day to day mixed with your why, you know, the purpose of you doing the work as helping you go on a quest to overcome that? Mm. I like that. <laughs> I'm 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 simultaneously thinking about how I can apply this into my work day too. So Yay, I love it. <laughs> so so then tell me you know, you're the expert at this. So what do you, you practice what you preach. So yes. what do you personally do in your own life to create joy and play during your day? Okay, cool. So um, it, it's interesting that you bring this up because this was something that uh, I was actually personally reviewing um, over the weekend uh, because I love, you know, facilitating um, that it brings me so much joy, but being realistic it is a small percentage of like by you know sort of 
day to day uh, that I do. Um, I go through waves where I'm facilitating more, you know, more than others. Um, this is one of those seasons. Uh, but in times when I'm not, there are other things that aren't necessarily as um, as fun, but doesn't mean that it's not enjoyable. Um, and so first and foremost, um, what I do for the things that are very sort of trivial, um, like admin work and voicing and, and logistics and stuff like that. Um, before I get into that, um, I have a, uh, a playlist that I like to play that I, again, um, it, it takes me back to, um, like my childhood. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in the eighties and nineties. And so I, I, I have one of those like sort of playlists and then, um, I set a timer and then I say, all right, cool. I got 30 minutes. I'm doing some admin work. Um, you know, let's see how much I can get done in 30 minutes. Um, uh, that is accurate. And, you know, I'm not trying to be reckless and stuff like that, but again, it gets me into that, that mode and boom, you know, I, I'm good to go. Um, so that's the other thing. Um, and then as I mentioned, you know, before, um, I have in my schedule, um, pockets of time that are made, you know, I call it my blank check for play. So in those moments, um, you know, one, by having that, blocked off in my schedule, it will make it a priority. Um, I found that even as someone that knows as much as I do about play, if I don't make it a priority, it's something else is going to pop up. Mm -hmm. And so I have these pockets of time. And while I call it a blank check for play is that um, in that moment, I will, it's almost like a choose your own adventure. What do I need in that moment that's going to help me, um, you know, from, so when I get back into the work, um, I'm rejuvenated. So sometimes, you know, um, especially when the weather's nice, you know, <laughs> I've been behind a screen for hours, I'll go outside and, and I'll do something outside. Um, you know, other times, um, you know, I, um, I personally, one of the things that I love to do when I was younger was play with Legos. So I have a, like a little sack, uh, full of just, um, loose Lego pieces and I'll give myself like, you know, 20 minutes. And again, I'm just m working with my hands. I'm not necessarily trying to build anything particular. Um, but, you know, I'm playing with that. And again, for me, you know, that brings joy for me. That might not be something that is interesting for someone else. But for me, it's play. And that time away from, you know, the the work and, you know, from my my desk, um, you know, is is the time that I need so that when I can jump back into it, I've given my brain a chance to sort of decompress, step yeah. away from my my desk and then i jump back in and i'm more focused and ready to go so that's again some of the things that i do um for me personally and one thing this is a challenge for a lot of adults um however there's a lot of benefits for this and it's something that i still struggle with and, and i'm trying to get better at um so it's uh, a, a type of rest that's called meso rest so I most people are familiar with macro rest, which is like sleep. Um, and that's important. It's important, you know, to to get sleep. And I'm not one to say that you need eight hours. But if that's the type of person, you know, for you, that's great. I'm just saying, you know, get some sort of rest and make sure it's restful. Um, and most people know of macro rest and the micro rest are the breaks that I talk about um, in between the work that allow you to sort of fuel up. But meso rest that's where you step away from the work altogether. Um, you know, that can be in the form of maybe a vacation or a sabbatical. And again, that's not necessarily accessible to most people. And so I say, you know, can you pick a day where, you know, maybe your schedule is a little bit lighter and you can step away and do something that brings you joy? And so I try to do that on Fridays um, where I, again, I block out some time. So I, you know, don't get um, inundated with sort of, other people's agenda. Um, and then I try to do something that, you know, that, um, you know, sparks joy for me. And why, why that works is when you are away from your sort of work, that's usually when you come up with these amazing ideas. Um, there's research that suggests that, um, people that were inventors and their job were to come up with patents. The, inventors that had hobbies came up with three times more patents than those that didn't have a hobby. Mm. Yeah. I guess that's so, with why, why we come up with our best ideas in the shower, right? Exactly. <laughs> We're not in the work. And so, yeah. uh, and so that is me being intentional about stepping away from the work. Now, like I said, it's, um, you know, it's still a challenge, uh, you know, and 
because I have that big block of time, usually, um, you know, it will get by the end of the week. If I sort of behind, I'll use that to catch up. Um, but again, um, I'm better than I was and I'm still trying to get even more better with this, but I do find by having that and being consistent with that, um, I, I am not burning myself out as much as I have been. Yeah. Well, Gary, we are all a work in process. I yes. say that all the time because people think that I have this whole well-being thing figured out and I absolutely do not. <laughs> yep. I'm figuring it out just as much as everybody else. So I completely resonate with that. Well, Gary, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I loved having the topic of play and fun and joy. And I think that we all learned a lot from you. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was such a delight. Thanks, Jen. I'm so grateful Gary could be with us today to talk about the importance of play. Thank you to our producers, Rivet360, and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the WorkWell podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher, or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. The information, opinions, and recommendations expressed by guests on this Deloitte podcast series are for general information and should not be considered as specific advice or services.